Hello, everybody. Thank you. Uh, I'm inspired to do the thing that everybody always does when they're on stage. I couldn't hear that. Hello, everybody. I always feel so stupid doing it from the audience, but up here I felt compelled to. So thank you very much for coming. This is a good-sized audience. I appreciate that. Some other people might be coming in. My name is Professor Nate Brown. I'm one of the co coaches of the Santa Monica College speech and debate team. And this is the debate between our two team captains on the debate team and our friends from the British national debate team. So I'll get to those introductions. And let me start by uh, giving one of my favorite quotes. Jesse Jackson once said, deliberation and debate is the way that you stir the soul of our democracy. And I just love that quotation so much because what we do on the debate, the debate team is really very inspiring. Always as an audience member, when I'm working with the team, I feel like I'm more a part of the community, like I'm more a part of the uh, current events and the government and the politics and the decisions that I make or don't make sometimes. And so I think that what happens in debate, especially competitive debate, is really very valuable for stirring the soul. Of our, uh, our, of our community and our, uh, and our lives. So uh, this event was gener uh, generously sponsored by the uh, Santa Monica College S Associated Students. So thank you very much. Are any of our board members here? Uh, AS President Jesse Randall is here. Thank you very much. Uh, we're using recyclable or rather uh, reusable bottles, which is part of the Associated Students' fiscal policy to try to minimize waste, which I think is a very positive way in which they use uh, some of their money. And we are also funded by the SMC Associates. Uh, thank you very much, Kirsten Elliott. Uh, our guests, uh, starting from uh, our friends in Britain here, Chessie Whalen on the right side, graduated from Oxford with a BA in history and was a quarter finalist in the European Debate Championship 2015. <laughs> Matthew Wilmore uh, just graduated from the University of Edinburgh in human rights, uh, human rights law. Human Rights Law, okay, uh, and was the 2014, the 2014 European Debate Champion. <laughs> They're on a U.S. tour of, uh, I don't know, a dozen or so uh, colleges and universities here over the next two months, and they're going to be blogging the entire time, and so if you're interested in following their journey and their thoughts about the process, then you can find their blog. It is called, From the Land of the Tea to the Home of the Brave. Which is clever. <laughs> From SMC, we have on my left, Stephen Sands, who is one of our team captains. He's a second year student here at Santa Monica College and was first place in parliamentary debate at James Monroe High School. <laughs> and on my far left, Philip Krasovsky uh, is a uh, second year economics and, or math major, and really those sound like the same thing to me. A little me. bit of both. Yeah. Um, and uh, he's uh, intending or hoping to transfer to UC Berkeley, and we've sent quite a few of our best debaters to UC Berkeley, and he is the California State Champion in Congressional Debate. Last night, the British debated with uh, some of the best students at Irvine Valley College. They debated that Donald Trump does more harm than good to the Republican Party. And our friends on the British team had to argue that that is not true, that, Brit that Donald Trump does more good than harm. Uh, today, we're debating gender equity. And tomorrow night, they'll be debating at Mount San Antonio College on the topic of banning handguns. And I imagine they're going to give you the don't ban handguns side, because that seems like it's harder to make, perhaps. Today's format, uh, parliamentary debate. Each speaker will uh, go in order from uh, the affirmative to the opposition, affirmative to the opposition, and then two speeches at the end, which are kind of like summary arguments. Also, during a speaker's seven or eight minute presentation, members from the other team can interject by raising their hand, getting the speaker's attention, and ask a question or make an argument. And so it makes it a little bit more spontaneous rather than just a series of debates. And finally, I know uh, some of you are here for extra credit. My students and Professor Andrade's students uh, were told you can get extra credit for being here, but you've got to do a couple of things. You've got to take notes, you've got to show us your notes, and you've got to take a selfie of yourself 
showing the stage in the background. So let's all get that out of the way right now if you're getting extra credit. Look up that way, point the camera, and I will be in the picture. You all should smile. You're in the picture. <laughs> I'm going to suck in my gut, make it look like I'm in shape. Flex. Also, um, ladies and gentlemen, if anybody wants to take a selfie with me particularly, I also have no objections to that. I just want to let you know ahead of After time. After the debate, Philippe will be available for one-on-one -on -one selfies. <laughs> Professor Andrade? Oh. After the debate, we will also be doing an audience poll. You'll be able to use your electronic devices to indicate who you think should be the winner of the debate. So please stick around. We'll do that immediately after, and the instructions will be put up on the board. So please stand by for that. I said after. <laughs> this is coming out of your time. The last thing I want to say is I'm going to be timing the debate. The first minute of each speaker's time is protected, which means they can't be interrupted. But from the audience, I might be over there on the side, when you hear a loud clap, that means that it's no longer protected time and you can be interrupted. And then the last minute also is protected time. So that's how I'm going to indicate that to the, to the speakers. Having said all of that, good luck everybody. Who is our first speaker from the affirmative team? Stephen, come on up. Uh, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's been kind of a long road to get here, but it's uh, assuming it's been a longer road for you guys. Um, so I suppose we should just get into it. So uh, the motion today really stands, is gender equity possible? So before we kind of move into this debate, let's be pretty clear about some things. Humanity really hasn't done one thing in our entire history that even begins to approach perfection. Because really, at a deep and fundamental level, we're imperfect creatures on an imperfect planet. We haven't managed to really tackle any problem with universal or complete success, and that's kind of integral to the core of this discussion. In simple terms, we're a giant baby kind of just bumbling its way across the earth, and the best thing we can do is safety-proof this house. However, in regards to gender equity, we can break through the barriers that prevent us from, from living in a reasonably equitable society, even if with slight imperfection. Aside from the fact that progress has already been made towards equity, the question of possibility hinges on whether or not we can achieve this. And we can, through firm, simple, and straightforward methods. So in essence, what we're trying to say here is that perfect gender equity is something that's never going to be completely achieved. But we can get as close as we can, as close as we can, as close as humanly possible to achieving that, and that's really what we're looking for today. So first of all, what exactly is gender equity? The United Nations describes this as Fairness and recourse to principles of justice to correct or supplement the law. Specific measures must be designed to eliminate inequities, discrimination, and to ensure equal opportunities. So that's a very complicated way to say that gender equity is about equal treatment, opportunity, and rights in all fields of society, both domestically and internationally. Now today we're here to argue that through structural changes, through legislation, and by changing the law, we can affect an attitudinal change in our society and significantly curb gender inequity. So let's move into some examples of domestic gender equity, ways in which laws that have been passed in the United States and legislation has been changed that's helped change the status of women and other genders in our country. So let's start with the 19th Amendment. The 19th Amendment, of course, gave women the right to vote. Now, up until this point, the idea of female political participation was considered outrageous. Prior to this, women were viewed as being less capable of making decisions as men. Now, the ability to vote and this amendment was originally controversial, but now because of time and because of this law being enacted, um, this really got the ball woman rolling uh, for women to be viewed as capable decision makers. Yes. Were women able to use that vote and engage in politics as meaningfully as the men who had had it for hundreds of years before? Originally, no, and that's kind of one of the core arguments here in this debate. It's not an end-all, fix-all that works instantly. Rather, it's something that happens over time. It's a slow process, and it's incremental. So originally, no, this wasn't, um, women didn't really have the same level of polit political participation, but over time, the political participation became more and more um, substantial, and then eventually, we achieved equity in that term. So let's move on to a second point, that of the 1963 Equal Pay Act. So this made it illegal to discriminate on the basis of sex regarding equal payment for equal work. So up until this point, 
uh, men were considered to be the main breadwinners in society, quote unquote, bringing home the bacon. And women were really just seen as using work for supplemental income. But as a result of this law, as a result of stating that men and women should be paid equally for equal work, we really changed the political and economic potential for women to succeed here in the United States. And we also helped cement so? the idea of women as not just housewives and child bearers, but as workers and productive members of society. Yes. Then why is it that women still only earn 80 cents to every man's dollar? And why is it that women of color in particular only earn 70 cents to every man's dollar? This is a harm that does exist in society, and we're not trying to deny that that does exist. However, at other points throughout history, that disparity was even further. So instead of earning, say, 80 cents on every dollar, maybe it was 50 or even less. So the idea is, again, gradual change towards equity. It's not perfect, and equal pay does not really fully exist here in the United States today, but we're taking steps towards ensuring that. So let's talk about something even more recent, 1973. So this is uh, when we changed the law to allow high tier managers, really just giving them the respect that the law refused to afford them earlier, helping showcase women's talents and abilities in a way that put them on equal footing with the rest of the business world. So when we talk about the impact of this here, what we're looking at is a small change, a change that says, okay, men and women are allowed to apply for the same positions, but the wide reaching attitudinal effects as a result of this were much, much more felt because it doesn't just say that men and women are being paid for equal work, it's saying that men and women are being, are capable of equal work, and that's the important important distinction that the law is making here, and that's the attitudinal change that it did, in fact, affect. Now, let's talk about the modern day. Executive Order 13762, which passed in 2014, prohibiting anti-LGBTQ discrimination by federal contractors. So basically, if you work for a company that contracts with the federal government, you are protected. So what this really typifies is that gender isn't just men and women. So this combined with the recent Supreme Court decision on gay marriage helps promote the idea that not only are men and women equal and worthy of rights, but everyone is equal and worthy of rights. And that's something that's very important and has been affected through legislative change. So although these laws may not have fully gotten rid of inequity, it's really clear that they've helped bridge the social, economic, and political gaps between genders. It's important to realize that change is always possible and always real, and with continued legislation, we can move towards gender equity. So let's talk about this not only on the domestic front, but on the international front as well. Nordic countries have taken large steps in recent times towards gender equity. So let's move out of the US and show that this isn't really a localized phenomena. Rather, this is an effective method that we can implement throughout the world. So let's take the Prime Minister of Iceland. The Prime Minister is committed to eliminating the gender pay gap by 2022. Now currently in Iceland, women are paid 6 to 18% less than men, which is a, um, a smaller disparity than in the United States. So by conducting major audits of all companies in Iceland to ensure that women are being paid fairly, this gender wage gap is going to shrink even further to the point where eventually it's going to be reduced to nothing. And that's the whole goal. The administration is also going to sponsor major reports on the status of women in media in Iceland in order to achieve parity by 2020. So this is a step further than the U.S. government has currently gone and an idea for policy that we can also enact in the future. People that are surrounded by people that are being paid equitably is going to lead to a shift in social understanding due to exposure. Eventually, people are going to accept the idea that genders are equally capable of doing equal work. In fact, on that point, in Denmark, quotas were established for female participation in government and in business in order to ensure equal representation. The policy has been so effective that the quotas have now been removed because they've become redundant. The representation is already equal with or without the law. So again, another example of how this structural change has led to the attitudinal change. So basically, these are all examples that show how gender equity is possible. It's important to note that none of these individual policies are going to create gender equity. It's through combinations and variations of these policies, as well as more, that is going to lead to gender equity. They're not going to suffice as proof that gender equity has been achieved, but they're enough to suffice uh, proof that gender equity is definitely possible through legislation. You know, there's an old saying that says, how do you eat an elephant? And of course, unless you're a vegetarian, the answer is one bite at a time. Sexism is ingrained and a very large problem in our society. It's existed for thousands of years, and now we've begun to take steps to eradicate it. Each piece of legislation is another bite out of the elephant, and with enough legislation and enough time, the elephant will be gone. And therefore, we are proud to affirm. Thank you. First of all, I'd like to offer our warmest thanks from both Matt and myself 
for the incredible welcome that we have had uh, here. It's been from Nate, from Stephen, from Philip, and from everybody else that we've spoken to who've welcomed us so warmly to your wonderful campus. We are so happy to be here, so happy to be sharing with you guys in debate, uh, and hopefully you will enjoy this. Onwards. So Beyonce may be pretty near perfect, but I reckon she's wrong about at least one thing. The answer to who run the world is not, and is not even approaching the possibility of being girls. Gender inequity affects absolutely everyone in this room, in this city, around the world. In particular women, but women and men and other genders, right? From every moment, from the moment that they are born, Children are conditioned by advertising, by their education, by the media, to believe that men are or should be strong, powerful, intelligent world leaders, and that women are or should be beautiful, kind mothers, wives who sit in their place. We think, no thanks, that legislative change, that the kinds of policies that these guys talk to you about are stalling the, pro 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 the progress of gender equity because they prevent rather than creating attitudinal change. And they mean that we don't solve the much bigger problems than stuff like women not having access to the vote, the much bigger and more deep-rooted problems that we have in our society today. And that's what I'm going to look at in this speech. I'm going to look at why societal changes in the way that we think about gender, the way we think about gender roles, are absolutely necessary to even approaching gender inequity, and why the policies that these guys want to talk to you about, why legislative change prevents those and is mutually exclusive with those things. So on this first thing, and why incredibly big problems need a far bigger solution than we think we've got. Because the impacts of gender inequity are not always things that you can legislate for. They're not always as obvious as somebody not being allowed to go to a polling booth on an election day. They're things like sexual and domestic violence that impact that millions of women every year who, who never speak out about them. It's about women being as, the assumed caregivers as soon as they decide that they want to have a child in their family. It's about advertising extorting money out of me every month when I go and buy a new mascara because somebody somewhere has been telling me since I was tiny that my eyelashes should be unnaturally long. Right? They don't tell Matt that. He's got very pretty eyelashes, actually. Um, but, but that's irrelevant, right? It shouldn't, it shouldn't matter. Um, I shouldn't be having to be sending that money. It's about schools telling girls that actually engineering probably isn't for them, right? Or, oh, maths is the thing that girls find hard, so you might need to work harder on that. That is just factually untrue, but it is told to millions of girls around the country. Those things are incredibly difficult to, to make changes for on a wide-scale legislative thing because they are, they are just pervasive. They sit in our society. They are ideas. They are not things that are like obvious barriers that you can take down with a law. Even when we do use laws, though, often the most vulnerable women are not protected. Matt says in a point of information that the Equal Pay Act might have been enacted, but you know, decades later, we are still so far away from that. Women in the UK are paid 73 pence uh, for every pound a man does for the same job, right? The 19th Amendment, it is true that women now have the vote, but like 100 years later, there is one woman running to be the Republican candidate in the presidential election. There has never been a woman president of the United States. We've managed one prime minister, and to be honest, I wasn't a fan. Um, <laughs> Women don't have a voice at the major tables. They might have a voice in their local elections, but so often that is a meaningless one when that power is so concentrated in Congress, so concentrated in Washington. That is where women need a voice. They don't have one there. The 19th Amendment didn't, didn't, didn't give them that political voice. Um, Roe versus Wade, right? It's been around for 40 years, but there are still loopholes. There are still women who never ac have safe access to ab abortion uh, because there are protests outside those abortion clinics, because their families uh, have, have, have told them that it is not an option for them and that they have no other way of funding that. Legislation doesn't protect the really vulnerable. And it, it is failing to reach the wider problems in our society, those sort of attitudinal ideas that, are, that come through your education system telling you that girls aren't engineers, that come through adverts telling me that my skin should be less blemished than it is, whatever even that means, right? Those are the things that we need to change. And now what I'm going to do is tell you why legislative change, like these guys talk to you about, 
is actually stopping a wider attitudinal change happening, which means that we're not going to get to gender equity. They're mutually exclusive because there is a massive weight of narratives that say that the gender roles that we have currently are good. The gender roles that we have currently are the right ones that we have. See websites of men's rights activists that put my friend online declaring her to be a feminazi bitch, sorry for the language, um, because she, she spoke in a debate against a man and suggested that women might be unequal. See Donald Trump's comments on the appearance of that only woman in the Republican uh, sort of primaries as opposed to talking about her policies. See the fact that like, women are consistently shamed for where they were, how much they drunk or what they were wearing when they, when they do, when they are brave enough to stand up and say that they were victims of sexual assault. These ideas don't come from just fringe groups, right? These are incredibly mainstream thoughts from mainstream politicians, from the justice service, from magazines, and things like that. The people who, who aren't as enlightened and feminist as I hope that we all are in this room, right, are aggravated by what they see as like unfair affirmative action policies, unfair protection of women that isn't being extended to men. You see this in narratives about affirmative action for African-American students as well, right? They are incredibly easy to access for a group that is worried about their power slipping from their grasp. They incredibly quickly pick up traction on the internet, on Facebook pages. And they mean that the political capital, the political will, and the support for women who need not just legislative change, but attitudinal change, gets totally lost and totally smothered by those things. The impact of this is that we lose incredibly valuable allies because there's a whole group of people in the middle who have probably never really thought about the things that are affecting women's day-to-day -day lives, never really thought about the pervasive gender inequity that exists in their society. But when they hear that women are consistently getting a leg up and they're consistently being talked about in legislation and they're consistently being helped out by the government in a way that men aren't, are they more likely to turn off from feminist arguments that say, no, women need this help and not just this help, we need so much more? And are they more likely to turn on to arguments that say women should be trying harder, they've had the vote for 100 years, we've kind of solved this problem for them. That's the impact that these kinds of legislative changes have on that whole group of people in the middle who we don't think are bad people. We don't think they don't ultimately care about women if you ask them to and ask them to think about it. But the narrative that happens is that they think that this problem is already sorted, that they think legislation has, chose, uh, has solved for this. We lose those valuable allies. We lose political energy for pushing for much deeper social change that needs to come from the way that we talk about women and men, the way we talk about girls and boys in schools before they even realize the difference between them, right? It means that we lose an opportunity to tackle the very roots of this problem. So the kinds of solutions the government do suggest have some benefits have this hidden harm, right? This hidden harm of losing us a massive opportunity and losing us the ultimate route to gender equity. Uh, proud to oppose. I keep having very, very constant suspicions that the AS did not put water in here. <laughs> but thank you, in that sense. Before I do begin, oh, OK. Um, I do want to thank our friends from across the pond for coming out here and listening to the intolerable sound of my voice. And I want to thank all of you individually for putting up with my insufferability, and for that I truly cherish this bond that we're going to have for the next 35 minutes. I mean, hopefully longer than that. But that being said, I think it stands to reason that we get right into the discussion. Look, we are fallible. We, I personally am pathetic because I move from my bed to my sofa, and that's the brunt of my daily routine. We cannot give you the Rolls Royce of gender equity. We can give you Honda Civic, okay? That's the best that anybody will ever do for you. 
And my problem particularly is that our friends are painting it as a Chevy Nova, all right? It's a bad car, but it is a Honda Civic. And the main point I want to make here is that go back around 90 years ago, and you will find that this debate wouldn't have even taken place. This would be banned. And I want to make a point of that on a variety of things they've said. Yes, women are conditioned to buy a bunch of things that tell them that they're ugly or that they need to be less ugly. That is true, but it gets better. And a great example of that is Ronda Rousey. And I'm going to try not say anything bad about her because if I do, I worry she might actually kill me. But that being said, people like Ronda Rousey wouldn't have existed 90 years ago. It's gotten better. Yes, children are conditioned, but it has gotten better. And we can. We can change the attitude, attitudes of the people by changing the laws that uphold our society. Yes, Chessie is right. There's sexual and domestic violence. But 90 years ago, the law didn't even care. It wasn't just legal, it wasn't even paid attention to. In 2015, in the United States and a bunch of other countries across the world, we have resources, we have, resources, we have support centers, we have policemen that are, oh, I don't know, willing to prosecute the case. Things have changed. And like I said, it's not the Rolls Royce that they would like it to be, but it's a pretty darn good Honda Civic compared to the Chevy Nova that it was 90 years ago. And once again, yes, schools tend to tell girls that STEM jobs aren't for them, that we should keep it limited to men, but I can guarantee you with 100% confidence that there are now more women in engineering and computer science and mathematics than there were 90 years ago. It gets better. We sold the Chevy Nova nine decades ago, and we're doing better. We're not promising you overnight change. We are showing that the law has fixed these things. Yes, we have not countered the deep social stigma that still resides somewhere in some small section of the United States, but by God, we've made it better. Here's the other point about Donald Trump, because I, I knew he was inevitably going to weasel his way into this conversation with his, we, his wig that's like slowly lopsided and falling off a little bit. Um, but I would like to ironically fire him from the discussion, because here's the thing. 90 years ago, if everybody went to a Donald Trump convention, or I don't know what you call them, it's like an AA meeting or something, <laughs> the point being is that everybody in the crowd would be like, yeah, of course. But people are upset today. They're upset, all right? You're upset that Donald Trump and his stupid wig, I don't know, it probably has sentience, I don't know. The, the fact that you're upset over that shows that we've even countered that social stigma against women, that people are willing to look at someone like Donald Trump and say that's outrageous. And the other point I want to make is that California is a really unique place. Not because of the fact that people wear socks with sandals here, and not because Venice Beach is a really weird place, ma'am. But because we have so many female legislators, it's ridiculous. We've had Barbara Boxer and Dianne Feinstein for so long that when you say California senator, I don't even think of that as a position. I just think of those two. We have... Um, who do we else do we have? We have Wendy Davis, we've got Hillary Clinton, we've got Sarah Palin, and I can guarantee you that those folks wouldn't have been running 90 years ago. Yes, America is a very slow-moving creature when it comes to social change, but it does happen. Um, but you disagree. Yeah, so things might have got slightly better, but legislature has brought easy wins and it means that people are giving up on the idea of gender equity altogether. Okay, hold, hold on, no, no, no. It wasn't a slight change, all right? This is monumental. Giving women the right to vote is not a slight change. Criminalizing domestic abuse and rape and sexual assault is not a slight change. Paying attention to the issues in the household through the law is not a slight change. We can't paint this with such a small brush that it becomes reduced to irrelevancy, and me and my partner refuse to do that today. Yes, America moves very slowly. We're a bad Honda Civic, all right? 
Maybe we're an 85 Honda Civic. I don't know if that exists. Somebody's going to check me on that. But that being said, we are moving, and we would not have done that had it not been the law. Let me put it to you this way. In the late 1800s, the United States made slavery illegal. When that law was made, you still had some folks, all right, folks, not people, but folks. You had folks somewhere in Texas or Arkansas saying, okay, you know what, I don't think that was a good idea. Some people were against that law, really, they were. But go to California right now, or go to even Texas right now in 2015, and see how many people still agree that slavery was a good thing. You see, the law has been so ingrained into our minds that at some point, I guarantee you, you will get a generation that treats the law as a norm, that slavery is illegal, and no other kind of philosophy could be seen as valid otherwise. The law is a long-term investment. Now, with the United States, that investment is particularly longer, and that's fine. You know, we're the kid, on the international stage, we're the B-plus student who's really bad at math, but eventually we pick it up. And I believe the laws we've mentioned can eventually help us get there. Thank you. We are the Honda Civic. Oh, I'm sorry. I mean, if you want it, it's, it's not water. <laughs> That's just a terrifying prospect. <laughs> it's quite nice, actually. <laughs> Look, it, it's just quite clear that I am not going to stand here and tell you that things haven't got better, that we haven't made progress. What I'm going to stand here and tell you today is that there is a limit on that progress and that through legislation there is only so much we can ever do, that through legislation we can sometimes preempt or even be mutually exclusive with better policies which would have been better fit. What I'm going to show you is I'm going to continue what Chessie told you and tell you this is a social phenomenon which needs a groundswell of activism, which needs a demand from power, not a plead to power. That is what I'm going to show you in this speech. Because it doesn't matter whether you are in Saudi Arabia, Sweden or Scotland, in Uganda, Uruguay or the United States. Because legislative changes just don't work in the way that they are supposed to. Yes, we have the right to vote for women, but they still don't have equal access. Yes, we have the Equal Pay Act, but we're still not there. The equality is slowing. From that big, quick jump, we are now decelerating. It is slowing down to the point whereby gender equity is not going to get any better unless we do something more than legislation, unless we do something more, more radical than what we are doing at the moment, because there's just no way the legislation we have at the moment is going to challenge those inequities in the way that these guys think it does, because these are issues are more complicated and are more ingrained than legislation can ever tackle. This is what Chessie told you, right? Because the law can never solve this. It's not just about pay for the same job. It's a question is, which jobs are you doing? Why is it that men are the CEOs of banks and women are nurses? Why is it that see men are professors and women teach primary school or elementary school pupils? Those are the questions that we need to ask, and those are the questions that we cannot solve with legislation. Those are the questions that cannot be solved with these simple dichotomies. Because it's not just the right to vote, but it's the right to run for president and not to have your gender brought up as a weakness, as something that you have to get over and something that you have to justify. That is the change that we need now. That is the radical change that we need and none of the policies that they have suggested on this side of the house even come close to that. Under their side of the house they have reached the Honda Civic but they are never going to upgrade any further. We want to show you a way to move up a class, to move into the new realm. Okay, so let's look then why is this appeasement and not progress. I'm going to look at two things. I'm going to first of all look at stereotypes and second of all I'm going to look at how this precludes more uh, impressive or more important policies. Okay, so why is it that this is not real change? Firstly, because things like quotas, things like legislative handouts diminish the achievements of women. In 1997, we had an all-female shortlist for a number of constituencies um, which were being targeted by the Labour Party. 
The women that were selected for those constituencies were immediately called Blair's babes and just decredited immediately. Because they had benefited from this perceived handout, they were no longer worthy of the positions in which they stood. We see this with Rwanda when they started giving more and more positions to women within their government, but over, over and over again, it was for children, it was for care, it was for things of, like women's issues. They were not worthy of the power of the president, they were not worthy of the power of the Chancellor of Exchequer, they were worthy to do the women's things. It was a small handout, a small token to stop them rebelling, it was a small token, it was a small handout to stop them asking for more. And that is what is so dangerous. So why is it so dangerous? First of all, reinforcing a stereotype. Because it creates a division between what is women's power and what is men's power. Women's power is caring, is looking after people, is being the mother of the household. Men's power is authority, is decisive, is leadership. Women's power is given and men's power is deserved. That is the dichotomy we create when we focus solely upon these legislative handouts and never focus our true like, ire upon the actual people who hold that power, who we just ask them, like, oh, please, sir, can I have some more, rather than actually demanding and saying, you shouldn't be there in the first place, you are here for the wrong reasons, you are only here because you are a man, you are not here because you are of high quality. Yeah, go. Yeah, so in the UK, um, oh, <clears throat> yeah, in the UK, uh, They've implemented maternal and uh, paternal leave. Doesn't that actually work towards shifting the societal values away from traditional gender roles by stating that men and women can both play equal parts in childcare? Oh yeah, it does something, but at the point at which a man's wage is still worth so much more than a woman's wage, he still has the incentive to get back to work quicker than she does. It only ever goes so far. It is never true equity. So this can just continues our expectations of what women do. It continues that tyranny of expectation, that lack of aspiration that Chessie was talking about. It lets the stereotypes fester because we never challenge the underlying norms which constrict our societies and hurt our men and our women, all genders within society. No, thank you. We never really challenge that power. We just let people assume that they deserve to be there in the first place. Before I continue, though, go on. Oh, thank you. Um, so, oh, God. So when you talk about Africa, though, is it not true that at the very least the role of women has moved to homemaker to legislator? Uh, yeah, but legislator only for certain issues. This is the point, right? You give them a small amount of power, but there is no way to upgrade that small amount of power to real, true emancipation without a radical change which moves way beyond the legislative moves that you're talking about. Secondly, then, why do we then provide real change on our side of the house, and why does this preclude real change when we take your approach? Because Chessie points out, right, that political capital, that ability to affect political change, is to some way finite. You can't really quantify it, you can't put a number on it, but it does run out, right? You can see this, for example, with Native American people or for First Nations, when people talk about affirmative action programs and go, oh, well, but they already get tax breaks, they already get land, they already get welfare, why do we have to give them this other thing? People get bored of trying to keep giving things to people when they're just constantly asked for another piece of legislation to help someone out. After a while, they just get fatigued. After a while, people like me, white men, start to say that you've had enough. Start to say that we've got tired of giving you more. This is what happened in Rwanda when you had women's quotas in government. They just stopped giving them the real jobs. It means we have to be really careful about the policies that we do choose. Because if we hit that point of fatigue, if we slow down the rate of progress, we are precluding the rights of women from our political discourse. We are harming the ability of women to really move on. Because why is this true? Because real power still sits with people who look like me. Look, I am not as clever as Chessie, but I am more likely to get hired in a job. I am much more likely to get promoted, and I am a damn sight more likely to get elected to public office just because of my gender. That is ridiculous. Why is this so important? Because people People start to look for people who look like them. Over and over and over again, white men will just choose other white men to surround themselves with. This means that there is never real power given to women.
women. They are hived off and put in another department. All you are doing when you are asking for that legislative change is not challenging those underlying stereotypes, is not challenging those underlying prejudices, but just is asking the master to give up their power. It is asking the rich to give up their money, asking men to enact weak policies for women. That is no form of justice, ladies and gentlemen. That is just charity. That is maintaining the systems of power which we still have. That is maintaining those inequalities and saying that they are some way justified, but isn't it nice when men do something for women? That is not the narrative that we should have. This should not be a question of handouts, but a question of overall rebellion, a question of overall groundswell which says men don't deserve to be in those places in the first place, and that we need a radical change. Legislative change preclude us from doing that, they stop us from doing that, and they harm the political discourse. For all these reasons, I'm so incredibly proud to oppose. that it has got better over the last 90 years for women. We have been granted some wins. But let's look at what the rest of humanity, or the men, got to do in those last, last 90 years. You guys literally put a man on the moon. They didn't go from a, a bad car that's name I can't remember to a Honda Civic. They went from a bad car whose name I can't remember to an actual rocket ship, right? You guys did that. You guys took the title of world superpower off the Brits, who had not been doing a very good job of it. Um, and, and also, you invented the iPhone, right? These are all like monumental societal changes. And we're supposed to be feeling like legislation has won by creating a few changes when we still can't get protection for one in seven women who will be sexually assaulted in their time on college campuses. We still can't get a woman in the Oval Office, and we still can't close the kinds of employment gaps that Matt spoke to you about that mean that regardless of which one of us is more qualified, he's more likely to end up being my boss than I am his. That change is happening, and it is getting better, but the case that we've brought to you from our side is that particularly from the current position that we are in now, where we've achieved some of the easy wins that these guys talk to you about, the ones that are palatable and easy enough to sell, the kinds of those kinds of legislative change are stopping the actual work that we need to be doing in order to achieve gender equity. They are meaning that we hit a limit. It means that we are not getting the enormous radical change that we need across all of our society. And there are reasons that we've presented to you for why this happens, right? The first one is the stuff that I looked at on resistance and backlash. Uh, the idea that there are, there are whole groups in society who don't quite get why we might need more when we've already been given something. And also, the kinds of people who will talk about women being given the vote. Nobody gave white men the vote. They just, they just deserved it. They just had it. But women were given the vote. African Americans were given the vote, right? That's the, that's the narrative that we used to talk to it about. And the kinds of people who are going to backlash against more legislative change, who are going to say, you've already had these things. We've already granted you these things. Why are you asking for more when there is this enormous other world of problems that they are not even considering? Also, the kinds of legislative change we get are incredibly tokenistic. They often reinforce gender roles. Like, yes, we do have paternity leave in the UK, but it's shorter than you can get paid maternity leave for. There is no good reason for that if you're saying that you want a policy that means that both men and women should engage in parenting because it is not a woman's role, that it should be equal, but it's not. Nobody reported on that. Nobody talked about that because they felt like they'd won at least something in this discussion. That legislative change meant that the issue fatigue that Matt talked to you about like kicked in. It's genuine evidence that once some legislative change is granted, we stop noticing that even the stuff that we got wasn't equal and there is so much more that is left to do. Why is that? 
It's because, as Matt points out, uh, he, as sort of a, a, a white man, he probably just doesn't know uh, and is, is, is less likely to care through that lack of knowledge about the kinds of things that I spoke to you about in my speech. It's the fact that sort of my male colleagues in university are genuinely shocked when they sort of realise the amount of pressure that there is upon women to dress a certain way, to look a certain way, to behave a certain way in all situations. It's a thing that the people in the corridors of power don't notice and don't know about. It, it, it is clamoured for and a little legislative change might happen but it's not the right legislative change and it's not ultimately a change that is going to give us a radical overhaul of the way we think about gender, the way we talk about gender and importantly the way we talk to each other about gender which is the only way that we're going to escape from those roles that mean we uh, just don't have gender equity in this country or in our country or anywhere else across the world. Um, before Stephen goes up, I'd just like to ask one question to the AS board, to those folks in the front. Am I allowed to keep this? Yes. Thank you. Please. It's not water. We now move on to the last speech of our debate. The leader of the proposition, or the government leader, you have up to five minutes. So I think that there's kind of been a fundamental misunderstanding here today that the legislative change or that there's been some sort of straw man here, that the legislative change that's occurred so far is the only legislative change that's going to happen. Now, side op over here has given all of these examples of inequity in today's society. We never claim that there isn't inequity. We've claimed that there was more, it is solved, and through even more legislation, even more progress will be made. We started with the Nova, we have the Civic, and we'll move to the Rolls Royce. And that's the whole idea behind this. Now, Sidop has again brought up that this uh, that legislation removes the ability to talk about these types of issues. I believe that legislation is the way we talk about these issues. This is the government taking a firm stance saying not that we are giving the woman the right to vote. The law doesn't say what you are given. It says what you deserve. Everyone deserves equal protection under the law. The 19th Amendment states not that women were given the vote, but rather that women deserve the vote. It's a change in societal understanding, and the way that we express this change is through the law. Society says that murder is wrong. Laws against murder are an expression of societal views, and they can change societal views, and that's the entire idea behind the proposition's case. First of all, on some of the examples that have been made um, by the, uh, the proposition, now they've stated um, some facts about the moon landing while women were still making progress in certain other fields. They, of course, neglected to mention that the chief software engineer that made the entire moon landing possible was female. They also have stated that we still can't fix many of these issues. We can't fix the issue of um, the way that women are presented in gender roles in society. We can't fix this issue. This issue. We can't fix that issue. But the whole overarching principle is that it's not that we can't fix the issue. It's that the issue exists and we haven't fixed it yet. There is more that needs to be done, and that's done through legislation. We can fix these issues. We can fix that unequal representation. We can encourage, through legislation, women to get into STEM fields and to participate equally. These are all things that are encouraged through legislation, and these are all things that are shown in our society through legislation. If this is what society believes, or this is what society should believe, then that is dictated through legislation. Legislation shows this change. Now, moving on to the third point, that that legislation is a form of handout. Legislation isn't a form of handout. Legislation, especially legislation that corrects something that is wrong in the past, says, oh boy, we really messed up. Maybe we should change our views on something. These aren't handouts and these aren't rights being given away. These are things that should be different and then they're being changed to be the way that they should be. It's not a matter of handing something to someone. It's a matter of saying, this is what you deserved. We're sorry for not giving this to you earlier. Now, on the um, original point of um, limits on legislative progress, the limits that have been presented by the uh, opposition here are pretty much limits that only currently exist. In fact, they brought up many points such as um, disparity in Rwanda and disparity in all of these other countries. However, in these countries, progress is still being made. In fact, in Rwanda, currently, um, under the 
he for she act of the UN, Rwanda is currently making progress towards more equitable representation, towards better legislative representation, and removing the gap that uh, was originally described. Do these gaps exist? Yes. Does sexism still exist in society? Yes, absolutely. But the thing is that there is progress that is capable of being made. We've demonstrated that through historical examples by showing how position has improved so far. We demonstrated that by showing current examples, for showing, uh, by showing how these current examples are going to lead to even further improvement. And eventually, even more further legislation is going to lead to that Rolls Royce. The whole idea behind this is that it's not... There's never going to be this radical change. The radical change that Side Op has brought up isn't really going to happen. It hasn't happened so far, and it's probably not going to happen in the future. These types of radical change have almost never happened at all throughout history. The only way we can do this, and the most effective way we can do this, is not by shooting the elephant and trying to eat it all in one bite. It's going to lead to backlash, and it's not the most guaranteed effective solution to the problem. The best way to eat the elephant is one bite at a time, and one bite at a time does mean legislation. If we enact this legislation, we move from step to step to step, and eventually there's going to be no need for this legislation because of attitudinal shifts that result from this. Basically, the law speaks to what society's values are, and when society's values reflect the law, then the law becomes no, nece uh, no longer necessary. The whole idea of this is that someday these laws are going to become redundant, and the only way we can do that is by enacting these strong types of legislation. Thank you. So in a second, the directions are going to come up there. I think they're pulling them up. Okay, as we're pulling up, so hang on, don't, don't vote yet. Uh, my name is Luis Andrade, I'm co-director along with Nate Brown of the debate team here. So this is, you know, what we work with, these incredible minds. Uh, before you vote, a couple of things that I would like to share is, and this is something that I, that I share with judges whenever we have tournaments. Whenever you're making a decision, try to put your personal beliefs aside, right? If you were very neutral critics at a court room, if you were a jury, right? And evaluating not only the delivery, but a lot of the content that was presented for you, who do you think made the best debating or, or, or engaged in the best debating? So the directions are up there if you text um, the numbers, actually, if you text those numbers to 22333, one person just voted, so, <laughs> right? So this that's, is all going to be poll, right? real time. Okay. It's going to tell us who is voting, so if you can text the number. Now, don't be biased just because we're in Santa Monica. This one is for SMC. So, so, I think it's covered right now, but... We can't see the numbers anymore. Okay. All right, yeah. Up in the back... Can you pull up the numbers again? <clears throat> it's still... So you can see Santa Monica's numbers. <laughs> you should put in that number. <laughs> Wait, Luis, can we vote for ourselves? You can vote for yourself, yeah. But I don't know what my number is. Um, I mean, comparatively... Should, can you scroll toward the left? We got an F because that's 39%, and they, they got like a D plus, so I think. Okay, for, th for those of you that voted for the British, you should have like a little text. Oh, 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 oh. One of you. <laughs> oh, there's a number. Yeah. Can we just keep it at that? I really like where it is right now. <laughs> this it's is a the tie. Best it's 50-50. <laughs> Two eight three five eight zero. Six zero. Oh, it's no longer accepting. Uh, I don't know why I did that. It so technically should be. Yeah. Matthew, how many times you voting over there? 
Well, it just so happens that everyone voted and it's 50-50. So, no, I think, I don't know, I, the software might have not allowed more than... You'll have to settle the tiebreaker by height. Line up, please. Okay, that's not fair. No, that's not, no, I don't, no, uh, fine, fine. All right. Okay. Well, the the goal the goal was to really do do show um, a winner, but it's okay. It, it it shouldn't have been a tie. That's okay. Yeah, let's let's go ahead and take questions from the audience about the debate, about debate in general, from either team, anything you'd like. Uh, Luis, I'll run around. Oh, exercise. Yeah, thank you. Um, first, I really want to thank you all very much. This is a very important issue, especially the girl over there. So much passion. I really love it. Thank you. Um, but, but it really, it really I'm, I'm considering here, well, here's my question. Is this really done for the class? Is this really done as an assignment? Or are we trying to make the change here? And, and I, you don't have to answer. Something I want you to think about when you go home, because we have come to the point where we need to make that change. And it has, it's really more than just an argument. Now, the system, it seems like, is getting us to think. And we've been thinking for so long, for so long. What we need is to tap into emotions and feelings. And that's what women have. We as men have been ignoring that for so long, killing women and not seeing the value they offer on a table. Now, my friend here on this side spoke about the government and the law. Uh, <laughs> as a system, you know, a, a future investment. And if the values appear, appear, then the system will not be any longer necessary. That's pretty contradictory. If the law is here to stay, then it's here to stay. And it's not taking women's, what they can really offer on the table. Uh, there's, there's a big change to make, and I hope we can make it through a different system than just this, which this is, this is important. This brings out a lot of issues on the table. So I learned so much. But there has got to be a different way to tapping into what women can offer. Thank you very much. Yeah, so um, you guys could probably tell this is like something that is incredibly important to me. Um, anybody who f felt moved by any of the stuff that any of us guys said, um, do think about what you can do in your life and whether that is uh, noticing that, it, particularly if, if you're a guy and you're like mentoring people academically or professionally, make sure that 50% of those are women or more than 50% of those are women. If you're a woman in a position of responsibility, realize that young women are looking to you and they want you to be encouraging and they want you to give them support and advice that you needed when you were in their position. Um, if you can volunteer at women's crisis centers or like any of these things, there are a million things. If the internet is full of suggestions, um, not all of them pleasant, but most of them are. Um, so yeah, uh, that's kind of my response to that. Yeah, d don't just have enjoyed this and, and do nothing about your life. Um, find a change to make. I have one more question, um, and it's regarding the same subject. Um, Jesse, seeing that 25% of the debate right now is composed of one woman, and the majority of it is 75% men, um, uh, do you see sexism in the debate community? And if so, how can you change it? And men, how can you help change um, the demographics in debate? Because I've been in debate, and usually you see more men than women, and you see more men winning debate rounds in, in competitive debate. So what do you think men and women can do to change the um, demographics of the um, activity? I'll do women and then let one of these guys talk about what men can do in debating um, to help women. Uh, so firstly, obviously, small sample size. Um, so perhaps perhaps not totally representative. Um, the, the thing that we sort of focus on a lot in the UK circuit is we've started to have women's tournaments. And they're for women only judges and women only speakers. Uh, and we tend to use them uh, particularly as a development tournament because occasionally and increasingly rare, rarely there is sexism at debating tournaments. And that can really put off younger women who are coming to their first tournament. And if you get a piece of feedback that tells you that you are a bit shrill um, or something like that, it just can be really, really off-putting for women to sort of have those very
very gendered comments. So one thing I've been involved in massively in the UK cir circuit is getting involved in women's only tournaments, but also asking women that I see in my own society or, or, in, or in other debating societies if they want to go to a tournament with me, because I've been doing this like three and a half years now. And if somebody gives me a sexist comment in feedback, I'm going to do something reasonable and proportional in response. Um, <laughs> And I can, I, can, I can fight that fight and, and, and sort of be there because I, I've got confidence in my own speaking ability. So I think the big thing for women in debating is to like look out for other women in debating. Call out sexism when you see it and you feel comfortable and make sure that it's as inviting a place as possible. I don't know if you guys have got stuff to add. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I, I did a lot of coaching and training when I was in, well, obviously still here, but also in the UK as well. I coached um, a schools team, but also as the training officer at my university. And while I was coaching that schools team, you know, making sure that I had a high number of young women in that schools team, like going through the uh, trials process, and then also making sure that you like make sure every single time anyone of any of the guys in that class made any comment that could be off-putting, like making sure you just jump on that. Um, similarly, with uh, training at university, I organised an uh, all women's training session. Obviously, not one that I ran because that would then completely defeat the purpose. But getting in a female debater that I knew from the University of Cambridge, who was like absolutely fantastic to run that session was something that's really good. I think also in a social sphere, if we recognize that the way that men oppress women is often through like these microaggressions, through off-camp comments, just through the way people look at people, the way they interact with them. It's then your job as a feminist man at socials, not just at the tournament itself, to just call those out, to always be making sure that if you see someone doing that, you go up to them and be like, look, that's just not okay, you can't do that in this community. Like, I'm, not, I'm not happy with the way you're treating my friend, I'm not happy with the way you're, you're treating my colleague here. And I think just being aware about those microaggressions and being willing to just stand up and go like, no, no, I'm not going to have that here, is, is something that we need to be aware of. I was not ready for this. <laughs> um, this question's to the opposition. Do you guys really think that legislation isn't helpful in terms of trying to get gender equity? Um, no, legislation is obviously incredibly helpful in terms of getting gender equity. <laughs> the, I think. So debating is, uh, those who were in the class earlier will have remembered me saying it's all about trying to find a part of one side of the debate that you can agree with. Because whilst obviously these guys are absolutely correct that legislation has been incredibly important and will continue to be incredibly important, something that I genuinely believe is that legislation can never be part of the story, or like the whole part of the story, and that there must be other bits. And that also that legislation very often does look in the way that we described it, right? It does look like white men handing out consolation prizes to people. And that we need to sometimes have perhaps a more radical discussion about this. A more radical discussion that will make a lot of people upset, but it's one that we need to have if we can have proper gender equity. So of course legislation is important, but I, I think I am relatively consistent with my side in saying that I don't think it's the whole story. Uh, this question is for the British team, or anyone actually. Um, do you think that uh, equality will get to a point where it'll be inequality for men, or do you think that it'll just stop and be 50-50? Uh, well, I mean, we're not really British, so that kind of disqualifies us from the first part of that question. <laughs> I think I'll let Chessie have a go, just, well, I mean, I'm Russian, to be perfectly honest with you. <laughs> Uh, back. No. Um, <laughs> uh, I think that um, in, in, in general, kind of the stuff that we talked about, about the people in power being quite good at holding on to power means that it's going to take us a really long time to get to 50-50. But also I think that in general, um, communities who remember that they have been oppressed purely on the basis of their gender uh, might do a decent job or a lot better job than somebody who's never been oppressed on the basis of their gender. Um, at remembering what that is like, um, I, uh, yeah, I, I can never envisage a world in which we have trapped men in the home and stopped giving them an education and not allowed them to drive cars or vote. Um, just not going to happen. <laughs>
Um, just one quick question. Uh, just as you said um, about the gender equality stuff, um, as you just said, um, uh, you know, um, you are, um, you know, experienced the um, the um, um, female only like um, the debate tournament. I just have a feeling like how everybody, you know, here like if a debate tournament is for male only, how people will think about this situation. So I think you just for me, it's like, oops, males only, it's, it's kind of sexiest, you know, for me. That's how I feel, but uh, as you bring out the point, I just have the question, how is this feminism really changed our perspective of seeing like this, you know, um, gender stuff, you know? Uh, so this was when, about five years ago, Oxford set up the first women's only debating competition in the UK. It was a it was a criticism that was sort of lobbied at us. Was that the idea that you know you're you're saying that women need their own competition? Uh, you're, you're excluding men. Sort of the, the, these kinds of arguments. I think um, it's firstly very different to the idea of a male only debating competition because places in which men's voices are privileged over women's exist in literally the rest of society. Um, so it's, it's, it's probably okay, and we're probably not even getting close to doing 50% of the talking in sort of academic and public spaces, even if we have 10 female-only competitions every year. Um, but on the stuff about making women feel separate, and I think that that's like a, a much more valid criticism. I think for me, as long as the tournament itself is carefully considering why it exists and making sure that it is following through on the promises that it makes to people. So we hold a discussion at Oxford Women's every year where we talk about what we think are the barriers to women in debating. Do we think those barriers exist once they're in debating? Do those barriers exist because they never come to a debate meeting and never get involved in our debating societies? And as long as each competition is working out why it's there and what problem it's trying to solve, I think it's then very clear that it's not just, oh, women need some help, but it is rather women face this specific issue and we are tackling it in this specific way at this specific tournament. So that's kind of, uh, I think, my response to those sorts of uh, like valid criticisms. Um, first of all, I'd like to say that um, the points you uh, have both made are incredible, and I think uh, a lot of us are going to take it with us in our daily lives. But what I would like to ask was, um, would you agree that I didn't feel like you guys really were on opposite sides sometimes? Um, I feel like legislature is the first step, and you're absolutely correct. It doesn't fix everything. Um, the bigger question is social change. However, I would like to ask you, how would you... How would you suggest that we go on and, you know, supplement legislation with the, you know, what you believe to be the more important issue of social change um, from a, you know, micro social level? Because obviously it, it takes a village, but I think the social change is only going to happen, you know, in a in a very gradual, you know, way, which is what they were saying. Um, but I guess more importantly is like, do you feel like uh, it's not possible to have equity of gender through uh, legislature only, or do you think it's going to be a mixture of both? Cool. So debating by its very nature is kind of about trying to carve dichotomies out of areas of policy which are never dichotomies in and of themselves. So we just kind of create this fake like to and fro between legislation on one side and broader social movements on the other. Obviously, any successful policy is going to have both. The question, I guess, perhaps can be which one comes first, which one sort of suscitates or creates that change. Is it legislation which creates social change or is it social change that then creates legislation? And I think that was kind of the way we were trying to get the debate to go, but unfortunately, like, topics as broad as gender equity are very, very difficult to uh, solve easily. When it comes to like micro society, things that I think we should do, I mean, obviously, I, I talked about in debating competitions, you know, it's just calling it out when it happens. For me personally, I, like, debating has been a very useful experience. It isn't just talking about things like in a wholly philosophical or theoretical level, but things that I have internalized in my own life. The way that I talk to my sister has changed because of the debates I have on feminism. The way that I talk to her about her aspirations has changed because of the way 
uh, the things I've talked about here. The way I talk to my mum, the way I view my mother's achievements have changed because of feminism. I think it's those like, micro changes that we can make that are really, really important. It's one of those big feminist phrases, right, that the private is political. And you're absolutely right that we all need to be changing every single thing we do in our lives and be always aware that... The, like the world that women live in is so incredibly different to the world that men live in. The fact that when I walk down the street late at night and there's a woman in front of me, sometimes she will cross the road. Right? I mean, that's, that feels really strange for me because I don't see myself as a, like a violent or a nasty person. But that happened to me when I was first year at university and I thought, okay, right, if I'm now walking on a dark street and a woman looks back to see me, I'm now going to cross the road for her because rather than making her cross the road, I'll just do it. That just seems like an easier thing to do. And that's just being aware of the... or trying to put yourself in that headspace, trying to understand what it might be like. You can never fully imagine it, but just trying and then changing your attitude and behaviour because of it, I think, is a good first step. Is that, if that's an answer. Thanks a lot. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think everybody will agree with me that uh, the four of you have given us a terrific morning uh, today. It was wonderfully stimulating. So thanks to uh, all four of you, uh, we teachers do some things occasionally right. Uh, <laughs> I have two questions, really. One is... Um, how do you define equity? Is it, the, is it synonymous with equality, or is there a distinction? And the second is, is gender a biological fact or a social and cultural construct? Thank you. So uh, there, is, there is a bit of a distinction between equality and equity. Equity refers to fair treatment. Equality refers to perfectly even treatment. And I think it's a very important uh, distinction in word choice in this debate. So equality um, really can't be achieved just due to biological differences between men and women. But fair treatment, based on um, the criteria that we gave, I believe we boiled it down to um, equal treatment opportunity and rights. So it's fair treatment under the law as opposed to saying that everything should be split down the middle 50-50. So it's more of um, adapting to the differences between genders and then using that to create a fair and equitable um, treatment in terms of opportunity, rights, and treat, uh, you know, yeah. So um, basically it's those three things, but it's equitable treatment, as in it's fair and not that it has to be necessarily even or equal. And um, I guess to answer your second question, where'd you go? Oh, hi. Hi. All right. So in regards to that second one, um, just based on the historical origins of the word you're asking about, yes, the two tend to be confused, and it often is assumed to be biological. Um, but based on the sociological definition, it isn't necessarily biological, and in many cases it isn't. Um, most teachers here have made that distinction that the biological sense of the word is called sex, and then what you're referring to is the is the other is the other word. It's gender. So there is a distinction between the two, and some people don't think there is a distinction. Some people think there is one. It's contested in some areas. Probably not at Santa Monica College, and probably not in California. But there is some dispute. That being said, sorry that took way too many too much time out of your life. But there you go. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. All right, let me conclude by saying this was really very good. I, I liked this a lot. Uh, a lot of people in this room helped make it happen. Some people traveled very far to help make this happen. And I want to say that the Santa Monica College speech and debate team needs a few things. We need highly motivated and skilled students who want to join and compete in debates just like this. Uh, we need uh, faculty members who might want to help assist coach, even if it's just for one day. And we need those of you who have a lot of money to give it to us. Uh, <laughs> because we have big plans that far exceed our budget. And so don't be afraid to do any one of those three things. Money can be first. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a nice day.